In the hardest times of life and combat, you, you learn who your most important teammates are. And on September 13, 2007, I, I truly was given amazing insight into who my most important teammate was. On that date, I was severely wounded in Fallujah, Iraq, conducting a mission to go after a high-level Al-Qaeda leader. I was shot eight times in an enemy gunfight, uh, across the body, took two rounds in the arm that I thought shot my arm off, and including a round in my face. I found myself fighting for my life in a emergency room in Baghdad. Uh, came out of that surgery in ICU, doctors telling me it was a miracle I survived. They moved me to Balad. They moved me to Germany for additional stabilization surgeries before I was placed on an ICU medevac flight and flown back to the United States, wondering what the future would look like as I tried to struggle against these massive injuries I was facing, inability to use my arm, and having a face that was totally blown out and destroyed. So I came home from uh, picking the girls up from preschool. So actually kind of funny, um, Brindle and Aspen were, were actually preschool um, at the time, so kind of funny to have them here with us today. But um, I came home and I just saw U.S. government, U.S. government, miss call, miss call. Um, I knew at that moment something was really wrong. Um, I started pacing, I knew, I, I was telling myself I didn't get a knock at a, my door. There's nobody standing at my door he, he couldn't have been killed because that's honestly kind of where my, my headspace went. Um, so finally, his commanding officer called, um, not somebody that you normally get a phone call from. And uh, later he said that was the most difficult call he had ever made. That phone call dropped three different times. So it took about 45 minutes for us to have the conversation. And in that conversation, he told me, um, your husband has been, your husband is the luckiest guy I know. He was shot in the arm. He has been shot in the face. He just came out of surgery. He said, you will not receive a phone call. Um, he is traked, he is wired shut. And um, that phone call ended and I really wasn't sure how long, like what was gonna happen next, what that timeline looked like. Um, then I started learning all the things that um, you, never, you never wanted to learn, this whole, hidden network and I started getting phone calls. So it was actually only four days um, of him till he got back to Bethesda. So um, I started prepping. I flew my mom in, Jay's mom was here. Um, I started prepping the house to leave and I honestly had no idea what I was walking into, how long I was gonna be gone for. Um, and I had friends that drove me up um, to Bethesda. They, uh, the flight home for me was probably one of the longest flights of my entire life. Um, I was in a lot of pain. I was really struggling, but I'll be honest, the biggest thing I was struggling with was I was terrified of how Erica would handle, and the kids, um, my state. I was uh, afraid to look at myself. Um, it, would, it would only be weeks later before I'd finally see what I looked like, but I could tell by feeling my face how mangled I was. Um, over the course of those four days, my head swelled up to almost the size of a basketball. All the stitches they had put in were fully expanded and ready to pop. Um, and and I, I'm a big history buff. I'd read a lot about World War II and Vietnam and Korea, and I knew that in Vietnam that there were a lot of spouses who came to the hospital, to the very hospital I was heading to, Bethesda, and they had come in and they would see their mangled boyfriends and husbands and say, I didn't sign up for this, and take their rings off and leave them on the bed and walk out. And then um, that was one of my biggest fears. Um, we had been married at this point for about seven years, six years, and um, we had not been tested like this. And I was afraid that, you know, and crazy to say this. I mean, here I was part of a, a high tier military unit. I had conducted all these missions. I had, I had been in firefights. I had been shot at. I had taken the fight to the enemy. I had even, I'd even gotten a hand to hand fight with an enemy on, on, on the battlefield probably several weeks prior to this. And, uh, and my biggest fear was what was gonna happen when Erica came into that room. And they wheeled me into my room 
and they were prepping me and the nurse said, hey, your wife is outside the door. And I was so afraid and I was like, I'm not ready. And uh, she's like, your wife really wants to come in. And I was like, I am not ready. You have to clean me up. Yeah, clean me up. What is she going to do? Um, and, um, and finally, I relented and I prepared myself. I felt, I felt like I literally was stepping into the doorway. For those of us that have been in combat and you make entry in a room where you know there are bad guys on the other side of the door, there is a mental preparation like I may get shot right now. And that's pretty much what I felt like when Erica walked through that door. I did not know what was going to happen. I fully expected her to... to shirk back and to be shocked. And, and, uh, and I told the nurse, let her in. So, you know, I wasn't really, I mean, I walked into that room knowing, um, not knowing what to expect, but I, I knew he was stable, he was good, and that we were gonna get through this together. Um, so, six weeks at the hospital he wrote the sign on the door um you know i would love to tell she didn't miss a beat I mean, <laughs> let me tell you what she came in that room she marched across that room kissed me right on the lips and was like we're gonna get through this and it was the most healing thing that i ever could have had in my life and it gave me the strength i mean she jumps right to the sign on the door Yes, yeah, several days later, I wrote that sign on the door. And, uh, but it was a combination of her and then that sign on the door. And, uh, and from there, everything was perfect. I mean, there was nothing but rainbows and unicorns. That's the end of our talk. <laughs> Not exactly how it wait, went. Wait, wait, what? Not exactly how it went. Um, I will say, Jay is such a positive person and the power of positivity is, is amazing. Um, it really is, is much easier to help and support somebody that has that positivity. Um, but yeah, I think we would be lying if we said that every day was perfect. Um, it was a few years um, into Jay's healing. Um, and I think everybody can relate to this, where you look at everything and you're like, you know, business is good. We had started a nonprofit. Like we were, we were impacting others. We were helping others. Our kids were good. Our family was good, but he was struggling. Um, he, I could see it on the kid on the soccer field with the kids, where he was he was angry. He was short. He was withdrawing, um, and really, you know, pushing you know pushing everybody away, um, and so. You know, a lot of times people will say, oh, my gosh, that must have been the hardest thing going through him being injured. And and it was and it was devastating. But at the point that he was stable and good, like we were both positive and pushed through it. And um, I think that was one of the hardest times because we were kind of in uncharted territory of of what to do next. Yeah, I'd overcome these physical injuries and the invisible ones were killing me. Um, I was breaking on the inside and really struggling was pushing everybody away and uh, heavily drinking. And finally, one day, Eric and I were going to an event um, and she called me out. Um, she said words that we had vowed we would never say. And she said, this is the beginning of the end. And I was like, what? And she said, this, this is how our relationship ends. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she said, if you don't communicate with me, if you don't allow me to help you this is how this is how this is the beginning of the end i'll be honest man it, it scared me so bad when she said that we had never we had vowed never to say anything like that that it shocked me into finally taking action and getting help and, and thankfully it was a, a launch point for me to both heal mentally and to be able to help so many others to heal to heal our family why do i tell you I tell you all that because there was a very strong foundation. There was a lot of time and intentional effort that got put into our relationship that led up to that moment. We had gone into our marriage many years prior and we had committed to treat our marriage like a mission. And we put the tools in place so that others, so that we could survive adversity like we, we came across there. We, we really approached our, 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 our marriage like a mission. 
and I operate at the highest levels. I operated what we call tier two and tier one units. And we call these units um, at the highest level. They conduct some of the most senior strategic missions that the United States government has. Uh, in the Department of Defense. And frequently are we are tasked to do with what we call no-fail missions. We're, the Bin Laden raid was a no-fail missions. There are hostage rescue missions that have, that have been done, nuclear proliferation things that happen behind the scenes that we call no-fail missions. And um, we, we had, the, 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 I was a part of one of these units and, uh, and that's how we approached it. So often we take our jobs or, you know, the military is, is great at this, having a mission, but why don't we take that to our personal lives? So for us, um, Jay and I both came from um, broken, blended families, and it was something very intentional with us from the very beginning that this, there, there was no other option, that this was, this was our mission, this was going to make it work. And I think that when you go into it with that overcome mindset that there is no other way, it does, it changes everything. It changes how you communicate, it changes how you fight, it changes, changes everything when you approach it um, with that mindset and with that mission. But in order to do that, for, for our tier two and tier one and our highest level units, it, it, it starts with selection and training. So training being one of the biggest things that has to be done. We train, there's so much training, years and years and years of training go in to be able to operate at that level. We estimate that the average SEAL in a tier one unit, there's over $2 million, $10 million that goes into just that individual. And we, and we have to learn everything about each other. We have to learn our strengths and weaknesses and, and, the, and the challenges we face in different environments. And we forecast what are some of the hardships that we may go through and how do we train for that? When we, and we, we look at all these things from training missions all the way to combat missions, even getting into the nuances of combat on a modern battlefield where we get into, well, how do we, how do we as, first, as, as first world nations fight battles? And getting into the rules of engagement of warfare, these are all things that have to go into our training to be able to operate at the highest level and execute no-fail missions. So why don't we have rules of engagement in our relationship. Why not have, um, you know, there's very clear um, do's and don'ts on the battlefield. And so I think if you can apply these also to your relationship, for us, um, throwing out divorce, um, throwing out, um, you know, mean, you know, name calling and other things. These were things that were off the table. They were non-negotiables. They were, you know, so, uh, you know, I'd love to say that we don't fight or that, you know, love to say that you're going to go into your relationship and not fight. fight. Yeah. Yeah. You're, we actually don't fight very so often, but I do think that, you know, our mindset of going into it, we have to fix it and having those rules of engagements where there's things that are off the table that, that, are, that are not allowed. So yeah, we love our, our new uh, rules of engagement. But it was years of training, years of working, getting to know each other, the, the highs, lows, projecting, the what ifs, all these different things came into that training. And the last as aspect of any high level mission and our ability to conduct no fail missions was communication. Communication is the most critical aspect of any military operation. And when you get to the highest levels of no fail missions, if you look at the Bin Laden raid, if you look at the Captain Phillips mission, some of the most senior levels of government were involved in the National Security Council. At that time, President Obama was sitting in that room and we have go, no go criteria, we call it. And they were the ones who were making the decisions of this is going to happen as things develop. But it's constant communication that enables us to get to that decision point of executing that mission. And it should be no different in a marriage. It's one of the things that we have talked about and uh, so yeah, and everybody says it, I think everybody knows it, how important communication is, but really, are we communicating? Are we communicating our business goals, our personal goals, our finance? Um, we were very intentional for us. I mean, when we got married, everything changed from, from I to we, it's how we've approached everything, very intentional. So 
you know, we're excited for our book. We're excited to share our story. Hopefully our story and some of the tips that we're sharing, um, we really want to help people in realizing um, that, their, that their marriage is an asset and doesn't have to be an obstacle. So thank you guys for yeah, letting we us wanted share to, our story. Yeah, I mean, in closing, the, the, the reality is in this life, everything will come to an end. You know, for those of you that are in the protector community, or I don't care where you are, your military career will come to an end. For your law enforcement guys, your law enforcement career will come to an end. Fire, your fire career will come to an end. For every civilian, there is a time when your job will come to an end. If you own a business, it will come to an end. There will come a time where your kids move out of the house. And there will come a time where our life comes to an end. But I'll tell you, if you do it right, your most important teammate will be there with you to the end. Thank you.